afternoon to be at the home of Austin Cromwell at 817 Nevada in San Jose in the Willow Glen District. Mr. Cromwell, we are indeed appreciative of this chance to meet with you and talk with you and your days at O'Connor Hospital. We might want to start, if you would, um, Austin, by finding out something about you and your family. Could you uh, tell us where you were born and who your parents were and a little bit about your family's story? Uh, yes. My uh, people came to California before, 19, or before 1850 and settled near Coloma. My grandfather operated a huge placer diggings there. My grandfather moved to Petaluma where my father was born in 1875. Then the family moved to Red Bluff where they worked, ran a large cattle ranch in eastern Tehama County and from there to ranching acreage east of Red Bluff in an area called the Bend. And I, I was born there in 1910. Shortly afterwards, my father and my mother and a sister moved to Dunsmuir. There, if I could get back to the bend, uh, that, that comes to a reference to the Sacramento River. Yes, that has a that's large right. bend there, isn't that right? That's true. Uh, it, the this series of ranches was contained within a large U-turn of the Sacramento River and it was serviced entirely by a ferry. No uh, bridge was built across the river to the two or three hundred folk that lived in this area until about oh, 1923 or 4. Uh, I, how about how old were you when they moved to Dunsmuir? Oh, just six or seven months. Uh, my father moved to Dunsmuir, which was a railroad town, and obtained employment on the uh, SP Railroad, where he worked until he retired. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had uh, two brothers and two sisters. Uh, only one brother is, uh, of the, that group is alive. Now for the record, what were their names? Oh, my brother's name was Alfred, and who died in 1936, and my other brother, Alvin, uh, is still alive. He was a professional musician uh, with a career with a big U.S. Army band called the President's Band in Washington, D.C., and he retired about 1965 and is uh, still teaching music in the uh, Santa Cruz uh, Carmel area. My sisters were named Rita and Frida and they are both deceased. And your parents' names were? Well, my father's name was Archie Cromwell and my mother's uh, name was uh, Mamie Scranton Cromwell, maiden name of Scranton. She is from eastern Shasta County up near MacArthur and uh, uh, Fall River uh, and the uh, valley in that area. There are other small towns that I forget. And then you were educated in the schools at Dunsmuir. Dunsmuir, right? yes. And uh, in 1929 I came to San Jose where I attended San Jose uh, State College. Then it was a uh, teachers college and junior college combined and uh, went four years there uh, graduating in 1932. When you graduated uh, uh, what did you do? Well uh, I suffered a de decline in vision which uh, didn't allow me to pursue a career of school teaching, so I found work where I could and I became the personal secretary of 
Mr. John Graves, uh, a wealthy retired, uh, um, well, I don't want you to call him, he, he was one of San Jose's early makers of uh, brandy. He would uh, buy uh, fruit. They didn't have the refrigeration and before World War I that's present today. He would uh, buy the fruit that was too ripe for canning and uh, gray it to his, uh, his uh, uh, place on North 7th Street and uh, produce brandy. What was the name of the, of the brand? Uh, it was a Graves brandy. Uh, through this uh, Mr. Graves, I met uh, Mr. Marisou and uh, Mr. Oh, that fell on the west side. Famous, uh, famous Paul Masson. Paul Masson. Paul Masson. Uh, and other early San Jose uh, people. When did you first become acquainted with the O'Connor Hospital here in San Jose? Well, uh, I think uh, San Jose Hospital is uh, an institution that everyone was acquainted with. My first heard of it was through the wife of this m m Mr. Graves for whom I worked. Now uh, we're talking about O'Connor Hospital. Yes, uh, about O'Connor Hospital. Uh, because uh, Mrs. Graves used to reminisce about the old days and she would uh, go down to uh, the uh, O'Connor residence and play piano duets with Mrs. O'Connor. So then I learned that the O'Connors then moved out to uh, their new building, that is uh, in reference to the time she was reminiscing, and that it had become a hospital, so I was aware of there being an O'Connor hospital. And uh, from then on, it was like everyone else's information in San Jose. It was just a good hospital and a, a place where they treated you efficiently and kindly if you were sick. Then uh, I, this elderly gentleman for whom I worked, uh, taking care of his business, uh, expired and I, by an amazing coincidence, I think, uh, went to work uh, at O'Connor's, and that was 1941, uh, in June. I can remember going to work uh, in November, and the Army, or it seemed like the Army, was camped in a vacant field across from uh, the old O'Connor Hospital, and I hadn't listened to the radio or read the newspaper, then learned that the Japanese had uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. Of course, we're talking now of the old brick building, the yes, old O'Connors, as you've called it. <laughs> that's to we old timers, the old O'Connors means the uh, building and its outbuildings. Uh, bounded by Meridian and O'Connor's, or not O'Connor's, uh, San Carlos, Osere, and... Uh, Race. Race? Race Street. Mm -hmm. uh, had you um, been, ever been a patient there at the uh, old O'Connor? No, I never was a patient at the old O'Connor's, but I worked there until it closed in 1953, and then what, what did you do there during that I time? I was uh, uh, a non-professional uh, attendant uh, taking care of the male patients. They didn't have many male nurses in those days, so certain uh, nursing procedures were allocated to these specially trained uh, uh, non-professionals. Such as yourself? Yes, such as myself. And um, 
uh, going back to uh, Miles O'Connor and his wife, did you ever meet them or oh, see oh, them? Oh, no, no. I, uh, had, well, uh, Mrs. O'Connor died in 1926, and I wouldn't know about uh, her or have, well, <laughs> our lives wouldn't cross in any way. Although the building was imbued with the uh, personality of the O'Connors. Uh, I remember... In what way did you notice that? Uh, in the... Uh, well, the... Much of the furniture was uh, late Victorian, and it was selected by the O'Connors. Also, the O'Connors were great collectors of art, and some of it, I understand, was uh, very valuable to almost priceless. And there, this art was hanging in the rooms. At the south end of the second floor was uh, a group of rooms or a kind of an apartment of rooms that was the original habitat of the O'Connors. And at the time I worked there, the uh, area where the sisters lived. And in uh, naturally, I didn't go in there except on special occasions for special uh, assignments uh, like helping <laughs> move furniture or uh, in some other way uh, helping the handyman and the maintenance men. But on those walls uh, were displayed more of these pictures. Then uh, a beautiful little chapel was on the uh, campus, and though non-Catholic, I used to go into that chapel occasionally uh, for funerals, and it was just filled with the O'Connor memorabilia and special pictures pertaining to the uh, religion that was that the chapel was dedicated to. And I think you also said a moment ago that Mrs. Graves had uh, uh, been acquainted with Mrs. O'Connor. Uh, th that's uh, what Mrs. Graves told me, although I think that her contact with Mrs. O'Connor was while she lived on Reed Street at 2nd. The O'Connors built a, even for San Jose's uh, best expression of uh, residences, a magnificent home at that site. And uh, Mrs. Graves would visit Mrs. O'Connor and they would uh, play piano du duets together. Uh, do you um, have any uh, stories uh, that Mrs. Graves may have related to you concerning uh, the O'Connors? No, no, I, I don't recollect. Uh, I just re recollect uh, the several times that uh, she said that she would uh, hitch up the family or have the family a horse and buggy hitched up and she would go down and uh, play uh, play the piano duets with her and visit with her. They were good friends at that time. Very good friends. Uh, getting back to the hospital, uh, do you recall who was in charge of the hospital when you first went uh, there? Yes, uh, there was a, sis a sister named Sister Vincenti. Uh, I think she was a sister who hired me. My recollection naturally isn't as strong as it should be, but uh, she was a very efficient uh, uh, administrator. And Those were the days that they wore the coronets. That's, that's true. Famous garbs. The most, uh, I sus 
think, the most famous coronet of any of the sisters' orders. And could you tell us a little bit about the uh, the sisters and the operation of the hospital at that time? Uh, yes. Uh, my sister Augustine, or Augustine, was the business manager, and I remember her saying that it took quite a while to get out the uh, paychecks for the employees. She says, you know, there are a hundred of them. And I guess now, just in the uh, business department, they probably have between 70 and 100 employees. And the hospital, when I retired in 1976, had 900 employees. Mm -hmm. And that uh, O'Connor's, the first O'Connor's, uh, was uh, staffed with only a hundred. About how many sisters were there at, uh, at the time? I would, the Daughters of Charity. I would say, oh, I, it's hard to remember, between 10 and 15. Uh, I remember Sister, oh, I can't think of her name. Uh, um, my sister supervisor for many years was Sister Clara. Uh, O'Connor's was her first assignment, so she was young and unexperienced, and her staff on the third floor uh, were about as instrumental in orienting her to hospital procedure as she was to supervising us. Uh, the hospital <laughs> had a, what now would be a peculiar divi division of patients. On the first floor, as was contained the women patients, and on the second floor was contained the men patients, and they didn't mix. Well, I don't. I mean, they, uh, not in a room, but even in, well, all the women are on one floor and all the men were on the other floor. And uh, at the south end of the hospital on the first floor was the uh, nursery and the uh, uh, area where the babies were delivered. Then on the second floor, uh, and on a wing built to the west, was the pediatrics floor. And in the back of the hospital was a U drive that uh, the ambulance would use, and then uh, unload the patients and take them either down to the emergency, which was in the basement, or to whatever area of the hospital that uh, seemed uh, appropriate. They didn't have uh, uh, separate floors for surgery and uh, uh, orthopedics and uh, so on. But all the patients, except contagious cases, of course, were put into one ward. So you might have a surgery patient and uh, an orthopedic patient and maybe other types of patients in the same ward. The Those must have been rather large. They, well, they were, in a way. Um, we, you, on the third floor, and it, it was duplicated on the second floor, the women's floor. The we call the back what we call the back ward contained seven beds, and then later ten beds as the need for space increased. And then the front ward, there were four patients, and then there were 
half a dozen private rooms and right near the uh, nurses station were two rooms I think there were 24 and 26 you see when the hospital was built they put in uh, narrow doors and a hospital bed could not pass through them. If you wanted to take a bed from one room to another, you would either disassemble it or two strong people would uh, turn it upside down and somehow maneuver it out those high narrow doors. So uh, I think uh, two or three of the doctors, like Dr. Zanger and Dr. Shepard and Dr. Biocchi, uh got together and donated uh, the labor and uh, financing to enlarge uh, 24 and 26 to regular hospital size doors so that they could wheel a bed in and out. Of course that's common to all uh, hospital doors now, but at that time we thought we were uh, really modernized by having just two doors out of about 40 or, or out of 40 patients uh, accommodation uh, so fitted. There, you say there were about room then for about 40 people? In well, the, on that ward. On that particular on, ward. Yes. Or floor. And uh, the nurse's station was uh, located at the north end and uh, it was a long walk down to the farthest room and back when the patient's light were on, was on and we had to answer the call. Uh, down at the south end of the uh, hall was what we call the bishop's room. And I think it was one of the original rooms of the O'Connor's residence. And it was a large room with a private bath and used whenever the bishop or Monsignor or a uh, church cele celebrity would visit the hospital. Uh, it was later uh, used or contained two beds. About how many nurses were working there at the time when you first arrived? Uh, no, I, I don't know. I can remember when I started to work, uh, there might be two nurses on the floor, although the student nurses uh, did most of the work. Uh, and in the afternoon shift, there was one nurse and a male attendant and sometimes only one nurse. And then in the night shift, there was either one nurse or if they could find one, there would be one nurse and a male attendant. For each floor? No, just for this 40 bed ward. I and I think the other wards were staffed accordingly. Of course, the uh, the nurses' uh, school was connected to the hospital, and the nurses, almost from day one, were learning by hands-on experience. Uh, they didn't go to school for three years and then do uh, a short uh, uh, practice training stint in the hospital, but by the time their th three years were up, they had had three years of practical experience uh, synchronized with the academic side of the training. So they were very efficient and uh, competent as uh, nurses uh, through the whole period of training and contributed greatly to the uh, nursing staff of the hospital. You mentioned the names of several of the doctors at that time, Dr. Bayaki and Dr. Shepard. Do you remember some of the other doctors who were uh, uh, using the hospital at that time? 
Yes, I remember. Oh, I can't think of these names. Uh, I remember Dr. Amaral, who was a, a Dr. Turco, and Dr. Pritchard, who at un, one time I think was uh, mayor of Santa Clara. I think you're right. And. Uh, Dr. Fagerstrom, a urologist, and Dr. Henderson, a urologist, um, and Dr. Zanger, surgeon, uh, Dr. Smith, and an internist, and Dr. Oh, those those names just won't come back, mm -hmm. although I worked with most of them. Do you remember any special incidents that occurred during that period of time that uh, would be of interest here? Uh, well, I remember um, vividly oh, it must have been 1951 or two. Um, uh, Dr. Horace Jones from Los Gatos brought uh, Yehudi Menuhin, the famous violinist uh, youngster, into the hospital. I forget for what uh, treatment. And Yehudi Menuhin was uh, so grateful for the uh, attention and the care that his youngster received that he gave us a concert. The, the hospital gathering place for social affairs or general meetings was a room under the chapel and the everyone who could uh, assembled there and Yehudi Menuhin gave us as good a concert as could be found in the world. That must have been quite an event. It was. And Yehudi Menuhin was extremely gracious. And his commentary on the music he played is still vivid. As far as the facility at large is concerned, um, they, did they have a gardening staff? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, they had a gardener who had been with them for 40 years, and I forget his name, but... Is that Mr. Valenti? Valenti, that's the name, and his daughter was a nurse, a graduate of uh, O'Connor's, and uh, one of the better known nurses of the staff. Um, Mr. Valenti was the gardening staff and his uh, ideas of landscaping and care dominated the uh, grounds. Uh, Mr. Valenti came to a sad end. He lived across San Carlos Street, up one of the little streets coming into San Carlos. And for many years he had uh, crossed San Carlos without regard to crossings or stoplights and one morning early he was coming to work and he just took off across San Carlos and was hit by a car and killed. Of course uh, it was his own fault since he didn't use a crossing or a stoplight but uh, the hospital grieved at his passing and we surely missed his uh, uh, gardening expertise. And then in the years there at the old O'Connor, there were undoubtedly many other events of significance and people who came in and out. Uh, was, did you have a child that was born there? Yes. Uh, I had one boy who <laughs> is the entire 
my entire claim to posterity. And he, uh, what was his name? His name was, he was named Dean. He was uh, uh, born 1947 and delivered by Dr. Schufel, uh, who was the uh, outstanding and perhaps the most prolific uh, uh, obstetrician of that day. Uh, it is said that he delivered 9,000 babies during his time. That's an accomplishment, wasn't it? Yes. And he was uh, much beloved by the entire O'Connor population. I remember in 1941 uh, starting to go into town and he picked me up and he had a 1941 Cadillac with an automatic drive and I was so impressed by that automatic drive, I guess the first in any automobile, that uh, the trip to downtown was very short. <laughs> Speaking of your family, um when did you marry? Uh, I married uh, in 1936. I met a girl at, when I was going to school who was the secretary of the health department. Uh, what was her name? Her name was uh, Ruth Praisewater and her uh, boss or supervisor was uh, Miss Twomley. Helen uh, Twomley? Ellen, that's her. Uh, Helen? No, not Helen. Uh, I forget. She lived on Shasta Avenue. But uh, she's a very capable lady, and I had taken uh, about 16 units of science from her in school. So uh, she claimed that she could never forgive me for taking away her best secretary. Was that Ruth, perhaps? Ruth Twombly? I'm no, trying to no. think of the first name myself. Yes. I think there were two sisters. They yes. lived for a time out there on Shasta. That's right. Uh, well, the sister came from the east where oh. she had been a, uh, a doctor in... She was a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist, I, I see. Mm -hmm. No, I don't... Uh, the... Uh, at that time, the head of the college was uh, Dr. Macquarie. Macquarie, that's right. T.W. Macquarie. T. W. That's right. And uh, you folks then married, and uh, did you have one child? Just one child. Uh, we lived on South 9th Street for a year, and then uh, built this house. It was uh, built by a man uh, named Will, Willie Pogue from Santa Clara. That's P-O-G-U-E of the old Pogue family That's from right. Hawaii. Uh, they were uh, very prominent in Santa Clara. And now we're Willie, talking about the house here yes, in Nevada. Yes, the house that he built here on Nevada, and we've lived here for 53 years. How would you get back and forth from here to uh, to work over at O'Connor's back in the 40s? Oh, well, uh, by automobile, as I guess everyone in San Jose by that time owned some kind of uh, a car for transportation. And I had a, an old 1930 Chevy coupe which served through the war. It had to because Automobiles were unattainable at that time. How was the parking at the hospital in those uh, days? Excellent. The I remember that in front of the old hospital there was a circular drive with uh, angled marking for parking, which was reserved for the doctors, but there were so few doctors relatively to, to today that they didn't use all the parking. So 
the Bitsters uh, took up the slack and the employees parked their cars out in back of the hospital and near the outbuildings which contained the uh, the powerhouse and the gardening uh, quarters for Mr. Valenti and a carpenter shop. But there was uh, lots of vacant rooms, so there was never any uh, any uh, problem of parking. I do remember at the south end of the hospital, bordering Osiray Street, there was a long strip from Meridian to Race that wasn't used for hospital purposes, but was rented out and someone raised strawberries on it. And they were very good. In terms of supplies for the hospital, uh, do you recall where the supplies at that time were being obtained? Uh, no, I don't. And from the standpoint of foods, were there any special foods that uh, come to mind that were used frequently at the hospital? Uh, no. I have no recollection. I remember that the employees ate at the hospital, as, and that was included as part of the salary. The uh, kitchen and the dining rooms were in the basement. The uh, what kind of a kitchen staff did they have? They had uh, a full-time cook, a full-time baker, and then two or three auxiliary helpers. Uh, I don't recollect whether, yes, they did. They had a professional dietitian, and she had two or three people to help her. The Student nurses ate in a separate dining room, and the rest of the health had its dining room. You mentioned uh, compensation. How were salaries in those days? Well, the, they were not good, even relative to the average of the day. Uh, the There, there was no uh, Medicare or Medicaid or supplementary insurance, so the hospital had to uh, make its own way. The nurses would receive about a hundred dollars a month, and the uh, rest of the, well, the auxiliary help may be 85 to 100. There was, didn't seem to be a set salary schedule. Uh, the sisters would pay you uh, 10 to 25 dollars up or below the mean according to their uh, inclination and whim. But there was a real devotion to uh, helping people, wasn't there? Yes, yes. Uh, the whole staff was more like one big family, and especially on each floor, where everyone worked closely together, and there was a strong feeling and a almost affectionate regard for each other. Well, what happened then to cause the move from the old hospital? Do you well, uh, any discussions as, as much as we liked that old hospital, it must be admitted that it was obsolescent and perhaps uh, 15 or 20 years past its uh, time of usefulness. For instance, uh, Seven, fifteen rooms, or fifteen patients, uh, were served by one bathroom. Uh, for forty patients, 
they had uh, one bathroom at one end, one in the middle, and one at the other end. The, the priest, Father Mulcahy, or, or at least one of the, the priests that I knew who served the patients. Where did he come from? Uh, he was a, Irish. He, he came from the old sod. And his attitudes and accent were fully Irish, but uh, as lovable a man as uh, could be born. Uh, his quarters were in the center at 314 and 316. I remember those uh, those numbers. He lived in the hospital. Then. Yes, he was full time resident, and uh, when they created his quarters. They used up the middle bathroom, so that uh, took one of the bathrooms away from uh, the patient's needs. So we used to run with uh, carrying wash water and uh, other appliances up and down the halls <laughs> to get to one of these far bathrooms. And uh, I think the safety requirements were less than should be, and the uh, other facilities that make a modern hospital were lacking. So the need was thoroughly dictated by obsolescence and the community's need for new hospital beds, and they uh, finally got the new hospital uh, built, or the first new hospital built in 1953, and uh, the old uh, hospital was abandoned in that year. Were you involved in the transition? Uh, yes. The movement to yes, from one I, to the I other? Was, uh, what, how, how could you describe that? Uh, the a few days before the move, the admissions were uh, cut down so that there wouldn't be as many patients to move. And when the day came for the move, the uh, ambulances and other con conveyances uh, moved the patients to the new hospital. It was done very smoothly. And I can remember two nurses and myself uh, taking all the narcotics from the our cupboard anyway, and we uh, uh, transported those uh, medications that contained narcotics as though they were solid gold <laughs> and were very careful with them and saw that they uh, got into the locked uh, cupboards of the new hospital as quickly as possible. And at the time of that move, uh, what was your um, duty at, uh, with the Well, hospital? my duty was to uh, help move patients into ambulances, and then uh, after we arrived at the new place was to help them uh, transport them to their rooms and uh, just generally uh, maneuver the physical setup so that we could start taking care of patients. And how did you find the new facility? Well, to us it was just heaven. <laughs> it it uh, was truly a modern hospital. Uh, and some of the conveniences we hardly knew how to use. Uh, they were so advanced over the uh, antiquated uh, facility we just left. Although, uh, in just a few years, that brand new hospital was uh, obsolete and uh, new additions had to be built to bring it up to date. And as you uh, progressed over the new hospital, could you just tell us some of the things that uh, you uh, did uh, uh, insofar as the, the 
service was concerned, your work there? Uh, well, the as I've indicated before, the sisters always uh, separated the men from the women. That didn't happen in the new hospital. They had to have, in different rooms of course, but they'd have men and women on the same floor. Uh, and instead of having all uh, categories of treatment bunched together, uh, they had separate uh, areas for orthopedics, for surgery, for uh, general treatment, and so forth. And in urology, and uh, some proctology, and in orthopedics, because it uh, involved uh, heavy lifting and some heavy equipment, the nurses did not uh, participate. That was uh, allocated to the non-professional male assistant. And that brought you into the picture. And, and in those areas, I was kept busy as fast as I could run from one part of the hospital to the other to uh, take care of a urological problem or to help with the doctor in, a, in certain types of examination or proctological treatments or setting up overhead frames or uh, setting up uh, the uh, traction equipment in preparation for the doctor to come in. And it was a, a busy time. Since then, they have eliminated, or at O'Connor's, they have eliminated all the uh, male attendants and uh, the nurses' aides, and it's done by professional nurses who do all the treatments that I used to do, or the other attendants. I do think they have one uh, orthopedic technician who takes care of uh, orthopedic equipment, but otherwise uh, the work that was a special department for the male attendant is now performed by the professional nurse. And uh, when you retired, or at the time of your retirement, were you uh, doing basically the same work that you had done for uh, several no, decades before? Uh, quite a while before, uh, they created a new position uh, called a senior orderly who uh, selected and trained and supervised maybe 15 or 16 other uh, male attendants and I had the job of teaching and supervising them plus uh, some uh, routine nursing procedures. Earlier on you had practically been the only one, the only male I was attendant. the only one uh, and in the old hospital I was many times the only one in 24 hours and I can remember them having a uh, urological procedure to be performed and I would be called from home to the hospital to do that. You were really devoted to the work, weren't you? Well, uh, I don't know how to answer that. It, it was a job that I could do and because of certain physical handicaps uh, I had to do what I could do. Well, you did a fine job through the years. How long was it that you were in the employ of the hospital? Uh, 35 to 36 years, from 41 to 76, or 77, I forget the exact time. I think you also uh, were interested in the history of the hospital. I was, yes. Uh, well, I'm interested in the history of about any kind, but uh, O'Connor's was so rich in history, uh, that I became interested and 
would talk to some of the old time doctors like Dr. Gerlach and Dr. Uh, Turco and Dr. Amaral about the old days and uh, developed uh, quite an understanding of uh, the old times from say 1900 to 1935 or 36. The, there could, you, some, could you share with us some of the things that people like uh, Dr. Gerlach and some of the old timers had to say about those days? Well, uh, I remember one story told by Dr. Amaral. Dr. Amaral was a fine athlete. He worked his way through college by being a boxer. And then later he was on the, I think it was a 1920 Olympic team as a uh, rugby player. There was a time in the, about that time, when they thought uh, football was too rough, so most of the colleges promoted uh, rugby. And Dr. Amaral was a terrific athlete and good enough to make that team. Dr. Gerlach was also a physical type. Uh, that was Fred, wasn't it? Fred, yes. Uh, he was an excellent boxer and wrestler and uh, very strongly built. He was a, a very masculine, handsome man. And Dr. Amaral was uh, his partner. Oh, this must have been in the 1920s. And they, Dr. Gerlach's office was downtown on Market Street, about Market and Post, as I recollect. And that was also the area where some of the Tufts would uh, congregate and uh, threaten passerby. Well, it seemed that uh, Dr. Gerlach and Amaral were up in the office and someone came up and uh, threatened them. Well, I, I don't know why they were threatened, but this fellow said, and if you don't do this and that, I'll bring up my buddies and we'll fix you. Well, he left, and uh, Gerlach says, are we going to let this, let them get by with this? And of course, Amaral says, no, of course not, and they both went down stairs to the gathering place of this group, and the ensuing brawl <laughs> cleaned out their opposition, I'm told. <laughs> I think Dr. Amaral also became the uh, physician for the uh, teams at the University of Santa Clara. Oh, yes. That was his uh, very proudest uh, achievement. Uh, I can remember when uh, when Santa Clara abolished big time football and Dr. Amaral went campaigning around the hospital just bemoaning the fact that there wouldn't be the big league football anymore at Santa Clara. <laughs> and. Uh, those were really quite wonderful friends and, and, and great doctors. Uh, You've mentioned several of the other doctors. Have you any uh, stories or recollections concerning things that they may have told you of the old times? Uh, no. Uh, those, uh, those stories uh, seem to have faded. I remember Dr. Josephson, Dr. Uh, Rutherford, Dr. Rutherford used to tell how he served in two world wars. He was in the first world war, 1914 or 18, uh, as a runner. Uh, 
apparently in the front lines the elect the electronic uh, didn't work too well and they'd have to get a message to um, a combat team a distance away and it was his job to do that then in the second world war he was a, a doctor in the Pacific serving in the India the Indian the theater of India um, and, and I'm sorry I, maybe as tonight when I'm not uh, trying to remember some of the episodes will come back well when they do uh, if you would make a little note about some of them and maybe you can pass that on to us yes I, I will so many of these doctors that you're mentioning are of course people with whom we've been familiar over the years like Dr. Shepard and uh, yes. so many of the others they're wonderful wonderful people I uh, think I think I knew Dr. Fowler George Washington Fowler oh, George Washington Fowler yes he I guess at the time was uh, the oldest practicing graduate from the University of Columbia I think he took his medical work at Columbia back east that's that's what I understood I I think that Dr. Uh, Gerlach was his uh, classmate. Yeah, I think, as I recall, that goes back to the 1890s, perhaps yes. 1890 mm -hmm. itself. And uh, uh, they were great, great people. How about the nurses? Do any of the nurses over the years stand out in your memory? Uh, you mentioned a couple of them, I think, earlier. but. Yes. Uh, Thinking of both hospitals now, the old and the new, or the one that followed the old hospital. Well, uh, again, my life was built around working with nurses, and I should remember many. I remember Nancy Carpenter, who is still active at O'Connor's. Uh, I remember um, a Miss Shannon, who later became Miss Bremenkamp, as the ideal nurse, and uh, a nurse named Gardner, uh, who worked uh, in the delivery room up until the time she retired. Uh, the how, how about the sisters, the, the, the daughters of charity over the years? Uh, you worked there under several administrators. Yes. And uh, uh, several of the daughters who, yeah, from an administrative point of view. I, I remember Sister Stella, who was a very popular administrator, and Sister Bernice, who was... Uh, Sister Superior, when we uh, moved in 1953, then Sister Margaret, there was uh, some kind of a dissension between the administration and the doctors for a while, and uh, Sister Helen came and she was a public relation genius. She wasn't there long before all the problems were straightened out. And I remember one episode with Sister Helen, that's my favorite recollection in many ways. Uh, one of the supervisors in, at that time was a, a Scotsman by the name of Joe McKinnon. And he was uh, famous for his frugality and uh, not spending money. Although many consider him one of the best supervisors this county ever enjoyed. But for some uh, occasion, uh, Joe McKinnon came out to the hospital. I, I don't recollect the occasion except that uh, he, it was necessary to, for him to be there either for, for some 
protocol or some ceremony. Now Joe was on the county board of supervisors. County board, yes. Uh, and uh, Sister Helen received him. And the Mercury News photographer uh, wanted to take a, or requested to take a picture of the two of them. So uh, Sister Helen stood very close to Joe McKinnon. Uh, McKinnon was rather a tall person, and the, uh, the photographer asked him to look pleasant, and uh, so Sister Helen looked up at Joe McKinnon, and she says, Smile, damn you, Joe! <laughs> <laughs> and Joe McKinnon uh, wouldn't, would go to no other hospital except O'Connor's after that, and it was he who told me that story. And he just chuckled all the time he was telling it. <laughs> he was a great person, and as yes. you say, a very powerful uh, political person yes. in the county at that time. Yeah. And From, uh, then the, the sister since then I don't remember too well. well let me um, ask you to do this, if you would, Austin. Thinking back uh, over the years in your service there at O'Connor, uh, what would you say would be your fondest or best memory and, and, and the thing that you like best about your work? Well, uh, the outstanding characteristic of this job to me was that one time or another, I would meet almost everyone and talk to him very personally and sometimes intimately uh, while he was a patient. And though I forget so much, I would hardly meet as many people as uh, one sports announcer says, close up and personal, uh, in any other job as I did that. Uh, and that must have been very satisfying to you. It, it was the very ability to help them. Yes, it it was very satisfying, and I still uh, have people come up to me twelve years after I'm retired. And some of them, uh, who haven't seen me for 40 to 45 years, and greet me as a lost, uh, long lost friend. And it is very pleasant to have these people remember you kindly for having helped them during a period of trial. After your retirement. Uh, you settled in here at home? Yes. And uh, could you tell us something of the things that you've been doing since retirement? Well, I'm a woodwork hobbyist. I have a woodwork shop attached to my garage and uh, I, when I can I'll spend three or four hours out there. This is all furniture that I've built that uh, is visible. The furniture in your yes. room here. And, uh, I also, during my time of employment, would uh, make furniture for the doctors. Uh, I remember bedroom sets and uh, dining room sets and uh, office furniture that supplemented the, at times, less than adequate income. Of course, everybody's income at some time or another seems inadequate. One of my uh, best recollections was uh, being on the founding committee of the 89ers. I was going to ask about your association with the 89ers. Yes, Could you uh, tell us about that? Uh, we, uh, the, see this was sister, oh, I forget, well, uh, this sister decided, or the sisters decided, that uh, there should be 
of an outgoing publicity campaign to uh, acquaint the community with O'Connor's and the uh, work they were doing. So they hired a professional who could develop that sort of a program. And one of his uh, first projects was to organize this group, and it was called the 89ers. Uh, and the name came from? From the hospital. Well, I think the hospital construction started about 86, but the hospital was opened in 1889, and the this group was named the 89ers after that uh, opening in 1889. And the a group of prominent citizens uh, under this uh, professional were invited and accepted and met to organize a program dedicated to the history of San Jose and to honoring the uh, the old time uh, names and residents of the area. They would uh, hold a dinner each year and invite a certain uh, group, maybe uh, the old Irish back those with the Irish background or Italian background or uh, Portuguese background and so forth, and up to 800 people would attend this uh, dinner in their honor uh, and uh, usually accompanied by an appropriate uh, program. Well, you helped in putting a number of those together, as I recall, yes, including yes, I did. setting up some of the displays of historic yes, materials. Yes, I was uh, uh, elected historian, or active historian of the group, because of my long tenure at the hospital. And I used to get in my Volkswagen and travel all over the county to collect pictures of the doctors to copy them, so I would have as many of the old-time doctors uh, pictures as I could to put on a uh, display and that display was quite uh, effective as a, these old timers of the valley would come in and look over all these pictures of the doctors and oh that was my doctor that was my doctor and it brought back memories. As you gathered that material beside that recognition and association that you just pointed out, did you encounter some good stories that might be of interest to us here uh, with the families that you contacted? No. As I say, uh, my recollection on, uh, on those stories or those contacts is rather vague. Uh, we didn't have much time, while I, so I didn't make it a social call. Uh, to get the picture, I would pick it up and then uh, bring it home or either, the, either on the premises copy it and get away for the next picture. Well, you made also a number of slides, didn't you, for uh, oh, historical oh, yes, preservation? I, uh, I, at that time, I was an inveterate photographer and uh, I uh, would take pictures of the new and old hospital and of people and of events that uh, are uh, the only ones in existence. And you still have those? Yes, I still have a few of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, the few that I've selected, I invite the 89ers to use if they see a place where they can be used. Well, that would be wonderful. We do very much appreciate that. Well, you're surely welcome. I, my only regret is that my health doesn't allow me to participate in this, uh, um, what I think, grand celebration of a great institution. Well, I can uh, figure it out mathematically. Being born in 1910, as of 18, 
as of 1989, you would now be then... Seven, 78, uh, I'll be 79 in uh, December. December the what? Uh, 16. December the 16th. Mm -hmm. Well, good for you. You're doing well. Well, uh, I'm really doing better than you know. Uh, I had some severe surgery to about a year and a half or a year and three quarters ago, and the prognosis was not good. And uh, I have surpassed that prognosis considerably and hope it continues, but it's left me uh, without stamina and con to the point where I can't participate in activities as I once did. Well, perhaps that is somewhat of a reward, that is your recuperation. It is yes. a reward for years of good and faithful service. Well, uh, I'm not superstitious, but I'm willing to believe that. <laughs> yeah, Was there anything else in order to... We, we know we've been with you for quite some time here this afternoon. And oh, it's it, a pleasure. It can be a bit tiring for you. But is there anything else as you look back upon your years at O'Connor that you would want to share with us or point out to us uh, that would have bearing upon the hospital's wonderful story? Well, the uh, I when I think of O'Connor's, I don't think back to the last third of the time I worked there, but to the first third and the middle third, uh, when the sisters uh, did all the supervision and uh, were the chief administrators. Now I understand that uh, a large lay group is involved, but it's uh, almost impossible to forget the kindness and the generosity of the Sisters of Charity. Uh, I remember about 1953 I was becoming blind from a peculiar condition called a keratoconus or a coning of a cornea and I thought that my future was with a seeing eye dog or a white cane. But uh, a young ophthalmologist was working at O'Connor's, uh, the name of Dr. Vaughn, and I presented my problem to him. And he said, oh, we have an operation for that. It's called a corneal transplant. Well, I didn't know how I was going to take care of the hospitalization, that uh, a day or so later, Dr. Vaughn came back and said, don't worry. So I had the operation. I had three weeks of hospitalization, a uh, pharmacy bill that wouldn't quit, and uh, specialist uh, care that was extensive. But I did regain functional vision, but after that stay in the hospital, I went home and I just wondering, well, now I'm going to take care of this. Well, I got word that the sisters took care of it for me. That is a personal experience of the kindness and the charity and the charitable work of the Daughters of Charity. And I know of many cases, many similar cases. In the old hospital, there was an upper floor that was one time the uh, quarters for the student nurses. And I think perhaps the sisters stayed up there too, I'm not sure. But it was an area perhaps uh, 40 by 50, maybe 40 by 60. 
And down the center of this wide open space, there was a double row of cardboard boxes, file boxes, just filled with uh, folders. And I don't know, what, what, what are all those about? And the sister to whom I was talking answered, well, those are old accounts that we'll never be able to pay, so we are just canceling them out. No. How? With a group that does that for a community, and is that considered as the welfare of many individuals, has all the loyalty and respect that I know how to give. So I say, God bless the Sisters of Charity. Amen to that. Austin, we do thank you for sharing these memories with us this afternoon. And God bless you as well. Well, thank you very much. That's been a pleasure.